Hi everyone, Adam Steele here, and today's video is sponsored by AIX DSP. I've been moving into the whole Dolby Atmos thing recently, it's slow going but we're getting there. Uh, but one thing that this has really highlighted is issues with certain tracks. And one of the songs that I'm going to be up mixing to Atmos has all the drums by the wonderful Mike Malian, who is one of my favourite drummers and uh, a good friend. And we recorded everything with the most luxurious microphones we could find. And there's loads and loads of spill. So today we're going to do a deep dive on how to cut out all the spill noise on snares, toms, kicks properly and not just kind of try and get by with some of the older solutions. Like I said, this video is sponsored by AIX DSP. This isn't a review, this is me showing you how to really get the most out of their multi-band drum gate. They have other plugins which I might use as well, like the Drum EQ, which kind of focuses on notes and harmonics, which is really clever. But the multi-band gate is a great option in a situation like this. Uh, when I'm going to be up mixing this to Atmos, this video is going to be in stereo, but as I pan things around, you're really going to hear things like spill on separate microphones that much more as all the elements of a thick, busy mix start to be moved out of that stereo image and the kind of the masking of the frequencies where you get away with murder a lot of the time in a, a stereo mix. Suddenly a lot of that is going to be really apparent, so the gating needs to be clean. Previously, I was using all the kind of the, the best, you know, gates, like uh, the Slate Trigger has a pretty good gate. The old Sonox Oxford drum gate, that was one that I used. That did a pretty good job too. Uh, but none of them really did an all-encompassing thing and sacrifices had to be made. We recorded all the toms with AKG 414s, which are a ridiculous mic to use on toms. They sounded fantastic, but they really uh, let loads of spill in, especially on the eight inch tom, which projected a certain sound, but then there was loads of spill. And on the snare as well, we were using Neumann vocal microphones, the KMS, I think it was the 104s on the top and the bottom, which again, sounded great, but were not really designed for this kind of application and had an absolute ton of spill, which I really, really had to fight with to get everything right in the mix. And so I'm going to revisit that mix and try and sharpen it up with these multiband gates as best I can before we go on in the future to then up mix this to Atmos. So without further ado, let's go to student. So without further ado, let's go to Studio B, the mix room and really dive in with the multiband drum gate. All right, so I'm going to kind of do two different things with this video. Firstly, I'm going to talk really in depth about what all the controls do in the multiband gate and how they're relevant to you using this. Firstly, as a drum gate, but I will mention also using it on other sources like guitars, vocals, and how certain settings can be relevant to you there. And then I'm going to go through a particular track that I've been working on. Uh, I have produced this track before wasn't particularly happy with the gates that I had on the kick and the snare and the toms and I'm remixing that song in Dolby Atmos anyway so I really want each individual source to be as perfect as it can be so at this, the second half of this video we're going to do a practical demonstration so without further ado let's look at this screen this is Reaper of course and I'm going to open up a copy of the multiband gate. I already have one here, which I was using specifically on a snare channel that already had been compressed live at the studio. So this has all the settings in, but I think what I'm going to do is bring up a whole new copy of multiband gate that is completely default. So this is my snare group that I have this on and I'm firstly just going to loop a little section in Reaper so that we can hit play and this is the multiband gate currently doing a whole lot of nothing at least I would if I had the threshold at minus infinity let's listen to that it's a pretty 
pretty good sounding snare track. There's quite a lot of isolation in between the uh, different microphones. I'm going to turn off all those reverb sends. This is what we have. It's going through the gate, then a compressor, then there is an EQ on the bus. So I like to use a gate before any compression or anything else. So what I'm going to do is have this multiband gate right here at the start of the chain. And it sounds like this with no reverb. So there's a little bit of ring on the snare, there's a lot of kick going on. And well, here's a good example where there's loads of cymbal bleed. And I can tell you, if, I've, if I unsolo this, you'll hear a lot of snare bleed problems in the mix. It's most relevant when the hi-hat's really going because it doesn't sound like it's on the left, it sounds like it's in the center because it's coming through this snare microphone and that's not acceptable. So let's go through some of the settings from the beginning. Uh, the first thing that I would want to do before I even bring in the gate is I would want to flick the lever for key listen because that then shows and we hear the uh, what the uh, frequencies are that this uh, gate is looking for. So let's narrow that down to that hit. Now these slopes are definable where it says high pass and low pass slope. I can change those just by clicking and dragging to be uh, less or more effective. But I do tend to find that this is absolutely fine as is. There is also a transient shaper if needed. So you can use uh, a transient shaper on your source, which I'm going to add some attack here. And remove some of the sustain from, not from the signal, but from what we're using to gate. So. There we go. I'm adding a little bit more mid-range back to that because the hit on the transient is all up there. I think that's a very clean signal to start with. So we untick the key listen. Uh, it's worth noting that the, the transient shaper option only appears when you're in key listen mode. So sonically, that will have done nothing. What I want to do now is bring in the gate threshold. Now, when we're looking at the gate threshold here, I'm going to bring that up a little bit. because what I've decided I'm going to do with all the ghost notes is separately, I'm going to have a separate copy of the under snare wires. It's a trick that I do a lot, uh, which can be heavily compressed and sit underneath the mix for that ticky, 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 ticky. What I'm trying to gate here is the big hits of the snare without overly removing everything else. Now, all the settings for the low, mid and high are all pretty much preset here and they all need tweaking. But before they do, let's look at another couple of features. We can change the gate source. We've used the audio, but if I click that, you can use a MIDI trigger. If you already have uh, something like a, a sort of a MIDI triggering system, uh, let's say that you had a, uh, a, uh, a clamp MIDI trigger on a drum, on a real drum, you could take that MIDI information and send that into this multiband gate here and very cleanly get every hit from that clean Pizzo pickups MIDI notes. And that's a really good way of using triggers that isn't triggering the sound. So you would then define the MIDI channel and it has MIDI notes all here, but usually like for a snare, I think that would be 
38, I believe, it, the the second, uh, the, the D, D1, so usually C1 is the kick and D1's the snare, but whatever note you want to bring in from your MIDI, you can define that. And if you click that uh, gate source again, you get both. So you can trigger it both from audio and from MIDI. So you can have a really clean hybrid of the two. Going back to the audio source, um, for drums, I would probably just want a straight threshold. But if it was something like, let's say, a guitar solo where there's a big and then uh, some stuff that's not quite so loud afterwards, uh, you could use hysteresis. And hysteresis usually goes underneath your threshold. So your threshold is where the gate opens. And then the hysteresis, or hysteresis, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, is where the gate closes again. So it gives kind of some wiggle room, whereas with a drum, we very usually uh, want a very clean open and close on a bang kind of threshold thing. Now, we're going to be moving upwards on the plugin from the bottom. So next, we're going to look at the low, mid and high bands. Now, I'm going to focus on one of these bands. Let's say the mid band, because all these controls are copied three times over for your lows, your mids and your highs and how you want to treat them. It's entirely up to you, but I'm going to talk about how it would be used on a drum. So the buttons, let's look at the buttons because these are really useful. Each one, so we're looking at the green one, has attack, hold and release knobs, but then it has bypass, which means that the gate is no longer gating. Uh, solo, so we're only hearing this band, which is useful for when we're dialing it in. Uh, mute, which entirely just, just, just kills the signal for that band. And then a phase flip. So a polarity flip. Um, if it turns out that we want to completely change the polarity of, of one for some special effect or something, then we can do that and that will change just that band. Now let's hit that S. That's why I wanted to talk about those first because now on loop, I can just solo the mids. Now the attack is how quickly the gate opens. I tend to find that I want a very, very quick attack on something like a snare. Although very rare that I want zero. Seems to be okay here, but often, especially on the low one, I find that really, really fast attacks end up sounding very clicky. And then we have hold and release. Next time I hit play, look at the green on the bit above and you'll see a bit where the uh, the gate stays open all the way, that's the hold. And then you'll see it drop off and that's the release. So if I had very, very short or no release, it will go in. Conversely, if I have no hold and plenty of release, it will start fading immediately as the drums hit. So what I probably want to find is a middle ground between the hold uh, with the dern of the, the kind of the note of the drum and a relatively short release that doesn't sound choked. There we go. And just above that, there is the floor, which is a bar that we can drag around. And what that will do is that can introduce a little bit of the ungated signal up to where you want it. So what that does is that gives you kind of some of the bleed in that area, which I probably would do in the mid range. Because that way, it sounds a lot more like a natural ungated signal, but uh, a lot like it, but not exactly it. Now, uh, that means that on that kind of mid-range, it can sound really kind of real, if you know what I mean, that it sounds not gated. Whereas we're going to get a little bit more extreme with the low and the mid for what I would like to do. And we're going to move all the way up to the top because here we've got the three bands. And what I can do is I can move around what each band 
is so kind of where those crossover points are. And so I'm going to move the low and the high around for the mids and define where the mids are. What I'm trying to find here for me on the snare is kind of the low range I'm looking to go just to where I can feel the, the natural kind of beat of the snare uh, without bringing too much super low end in because I'm going to quite tightly gate the low end to give me that doof, doof, doof kind of thing on the bottom of the snare without bringing any rumble in. But also on the top end, I'm trying to find where the cymbals really begin and make sure that's not in there. But most of that naturalness is. Let's find. There. That's about right for me. And the kind of the controls that I went across there, the look ahead, I like to have a little bit of look ahead on uh, a snare gate, especially because then any attack values, it's got kind of a, it's got a warning of, of how that is going to be approached. So that the, the gate is already open uh, before the, uh, the crack of the, that hit comes in, so you don't get as many of those clicky, clicky artifacts. Um, we've got pre-gate spectrum. So the pre-gate spectrum shows the, the audio spectrum up here completely unfiltered. Side chain, I'll come back to because that could be really powerful. Uh, key listen, we already did. And then the crossovers can be changed between 6 dB crossovers, which are far more gentle, but the whole thing about phase, if you're worried about phase, is, is less of a problem. But you do get much more bleed in between your uh, your crossover points. So the mid-range, which we're still soloing, now sounds like this on 6 dB crossovers. So there's much more bleed either way, whereas 24 dB, it's really far more specific at the possible, possible, risk of phase shift, which may not be a problem, depending on how many elements of bleed you have in other microphones. Um, that may not be a problem for you, depending on your sources. And then lastly, the red, green, and blue bars can be grabbed to change the overall volume of a specific band. That can be a really good secret weapon if you've got kind of the gating is right and now you want to balance the amount of low end, mid and high end without having to bring an EQ into the mix. It can be a real kind of clever, like a secret weapon there. So now that we've done the mid band, I'm now going to saw the high band and really get a tick, 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 a much more aggressive snap on this. There we go. Now that sounds really aggressive with that. Now let's try it in context with the mid band. So we'll solo them both. There we go. I'm just trying to dial that release in so it doesn't sound like a G -g -g -g, so that when we get back into everything being in the mix, it doesn't sound obvious. Because that's something for me that being able to control the high band and make it really tight is really useful for me. And now let's solo the low end and try and get the low end to be quite tight as well. There we go. So let's listen to that without the gate at all. And with. And now let's try that in the mix without. And with. So 
so much cleaner and so much less of that kind of worry of spill that now on those busy parts where the hi-hat's smacking away, that's not going to be in there at all. Now, I did say I'd talk about the side chain. So the side chain, if I look at that, which all the uh, knob controls are on the left, if I do that, suddenly nothing's going to be gated uh, because firstly, we've not defined a side chain in Reaper, uh, but secondly, there's nothing being sent to the side chain. In this case, it's not something I would need, but we could do the kind of classic, you know, kick drum and bass, kind of one side chaining the other. We could do that, but only use the low end uh, as uh, a band and leave the other bands with the floor at maximum so they don't get affected. So let's try that just to, just for fun. Let's put the multi-band gate on the base and immediately just click side chain. So what I'm going to have to do firstly is go into the plug-in pin connector at the top and add some channels, track channels four. And now the side chain left and right is being fed. What I need to do now is go back to my kick and I'm going to send the kick in microphone using Reaper sends to uh, all the way down at the base and change that to be going out to three and four, which is the side chain inputs. So now let's just solo the bass. Right, so what I want to do is completely bypass the low and high bands. I don't want those at all. And I'm going to solo the low band. So now with the... Couple of cool features that I've not covered yet in the settings that are kind of tucked away is that there's mid side encoding options. So if you've got something that's been recorded mid side, you can then uh, encode it on the way in and the way out. So you can sort that out. And so you can send mid side out if you want, or you can bring mid side in or both. And then the de de detector stereo encoding, you can uh, choose whether to use one side of the, the input or the mid side or just however you want to do it. It's all tucked away in there. Uh, there's of course on the left and right input and output levels. I would generally leave them where they are, but if you need to manipulate them, they are there for you. One thing I didn't really talk about before that I want to dive into is an extra feature that this plugin has that makes it a really, really powerful extra tool because each of these bands can be sent out to its own track which means that you can do loads of like parallel processing uh, without having to buy even more plugins. So as an example, I've got a bass here. And that's nicely gated. It's in three separate bands, but in the output here, I've changed the track channels to eight track channels. And now the output, as you can see here, goes output left and right. Then we've got low, mid and high all going out separately. All we have to do now is route those to somewhere. So I'm going to go to my base channel here, this gray one, open up the routing and untick master send channels. Make sure it has eight track channels. And so I've already had 
send to these new tracks that I've made. Bass low. So I'm going to define stereo source 3 and 4 because that's the low. 5 and 6 is the mid. 7, 8 is the high. So I'm going to repeat this a couple of times by adding a couple of new sends. One to bass mid, which I'm going to go stereo source 5 and 6. And bass high, which is 7 and 8. And we should hear all of these now if we press play. But why this is important is say the mids, that has its own channel now. So I can do something like I can bring a distortion plugin in of my choosing, bring in the one that's just JS distortion. There we go. So that's just on the mids and not on the bass and treble. So let's bring the bass and treble in. Suddenly we've got a big, angry, genty kind of bass, but the lows are unaffected because they're completely clean. I could limit the lows uh, like you would in a, in a mix, have the highs completely natural, EQ that distortion a little bit. Maybe it's a little bit uh, heavy. Let's put this the Reaper stock EQ on there. So bring that in a bit. And of course, if we can hear some rattle, on that, that mid now, we can go back to our gate and tighten it. And now that's a big, angry, distorted mid range. Do something entirely different with the high range. Do something entirely different with the low range. Let's just look at the low range. And let's bring in the Reaper compressor, good old recomp. Where are you? Too many compressors on. Make it completely infinite. Bring that back up by a few dB. So now the low end's got a limiter, the mid range has got a distortion, the high end is just natural. And that is one solid bass tone that was made possible by the splitting of the multiband gate. And I think that just about covers everything because there's a lot to go at. But once you've used it, it's really, really powerful. Now, part two of the video, you've just seen me do that on the snare. Um, now I need to do it on the kick because uh, let's get another multiband gate on there. Um, I've been using other gates on uh, some of these instruments and not been very happy. Like, um, here's how the kick was with the previous gate, which was the drum gate from Slate, which is all right, but this is the kick. Oh, this is the kick without the gate. Quite a lot of ring, quite a lot of bleed. And here's it with the, the Slate gate. Oh, there's also a sample running. I'll just kill the sample. So here's it without. And here's it with. I just was not impressed with that. It sounded flat and lifeless. So that's now getting deleted. And now in comes the multiband gate. So first thing I'm going to do, like I said, was a uh, key listen and Listen not just for the note of the kick, but for the real defined slap.
There we go. I'm not necessarily listening for that boom thing. Because if I try and narrow that down as the key gate listen, then that big boom is going to keep the gate open way longer than I want it to be open. Uh, I'm trying to look for that definite knock as the key. And then I can set my threshold accordingly. So too low and then... Now, one thing I do want to do is go to, there was a section where Mike didn't hit the kick as hard, very much on purpose. There we go. That's it. Uh, so it's triggering there properly as well as in other places. So I'm now going to just loop a little section and focus on the mids first, because I like to do mids first all the time. This probably won't have a floor underneath it. This will be much cleaner than the snare. Right, so firstly, let's... set the bands so that we've got the knock in the middle. There we go. So I'm using less hold on this because I don't want to eat, eat, but I'm using quite a long release so I get a bah, bah. So I'm tailoring the kind of the, the mid response of the kick to be really quite clean. And now I can tailor the high response to be probably shorter. Right, let's go back to that key, because I can hear the snares uh, triggering the key. Let's see if that plus the transient shaper can really bring it together, so... So I've brought some low end back in. And the transient shaper there is really cleaning things up uh, because now um, the snare hits are not coming through at the same level as the kick hits. Let's just turn off the low for a minute. See, that's nice and clean now. And now the low end needs uh, dealing with. So the low end's got a little bit of a clicky clicky in there. So I'm going to bring in some look ahead to try and soften that. Right, so I'm not getting the clicky clicky on the low end anymore, which is great, but the low end is rumbling on a bit too long, so. So now I've got a longer hold and a shorter release, so that is going bah, bah. But on the low end, I kind of want that because I want to be able to choose and define how long the low end rings for. Let's try them in context. And here's without the gate. And now, in the mix, without. And with. Yeah, that really feels like I, I now have more 
leverage to EQ that. So I'm going to bring in an EQ. Uh, and because there are certain frequencies in there that I don't really want. There we go. But I would never have been uh, particularly confident with doing this uh, before the gate was good. Now let's turn back on our extra stuff, the reverbs and the uh, samples and all that kind of stuff and see how much better that sounds. And now for the real test, everybody. Now for the toms. As you can see, I had to manually gate the toms because they're an absolute nightmare. And even then, uh, they were a nightmare because some of these sections, like this is with four or oh, three gates from Boz Labs, which again are okay. And you can hear that even with those gates on, it's really causing issues uh, whenever the drums are hit. So what I'm going to do is start with what was probably the worst tom. I've just deleted all those, um, all those things. And I'm going to leave the manual gating in, but this is a really good section to use as an example. So I'm going to just select that and loop it. <laughs> Because uh, Mike's really kind of, this is a gentle section of the song. There are other parts. He's an incredibly consistent drummer when it comes to the massive metal sections. But this is kind of a much lighter section. And using gates on really light sections in the past has been difficult, shall we say. So again, same process. Start with the key listen. Now this one I'm really trying to nail down because there is another tom that's going dum 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 dum. So I'm trying to isolate uh, that one. So I'm going to bring the sustain down, bring up the attack. Now, hopefully that's doing exactly what we need there. We're about to find out uh, by taking the key listen off and bringing the threshold up. And then doing each band separately. So let's start with the mids. And the solo for the high. Let's let's find some toms with more of a hit. Ah, let's we've not tuned our uh, uh, bands, so let's 
look at our that's that's a good one so there we go make the mids have a much more forgiving kind of release have there we go much more aggressive and on the lows we're gonna need more look ahead and there we go now, let's see how that comes together so with, with oh the multiband ugh, I put the multiband gate at the start it must have moved it by accident that's my fault Let's bring the threshold down. Yeah, there we go. Right, so. That's a really clean gate, probably because of that transient designer. This is without. This is with. Now I'm going to have to do this for each one of these uh, drums. I'm going to copy this across now, and it's probably going to be wrong in terms of the levels and in terms of the frequencies. For a start, the key listen will be wrong. There we go, I can really see it now. Now let's try it. So I'm bringing nearly 10 dB of attack up on that transient shaper there. But the concept is sound, so I can copy that across to the rack tom and see how that copes with, again, changing the uh, key. Just put in a zero for the sustain. And then key. Yeah, now now this is the tricky stuff because I'm getting dum dunk and I'm getting the snare in there. So we really need to refine the key. So the transient shaper doesn't sound nice, but it does. It does pretty much exactly what we need. And I can probably shorten the Tom's low end off a little bit. And see how we do copying this to the top one, which I think I had to be very aggressive with the gate on this. So this you can really hear the ch -ch -ch. there we go so the gate's catching a lot of that now on the high end that ch -ch -ch. so here's all four toms together
think that without the gates was like this. That's that's night and day. Let's let's try that in the mix. I'm feeling like I can turn up that low tom now. just sounds so alive now where it wasn't before. And that, that bottom tom now I can re extend the release a bit to let it boom. Same with the, uh, the, the, the rack toms. That is night and day difference, this mix to me. If I turn off these gates now and play this whole section again, so all six of the gates uh, off, I'll turn the reverb sent back on for good measure. It's pretty good, and now, Now it's really good. Like I can do things like I can allow things to ring. Where before I had to cut these gates really short, so I might end up revisiting some of this. Because where I, where I previously had to cut all my manual gates super short, now that's on me. I can fix them because I had to cut them where these next snare hits were. And now I don't. I can let the low end come out a little bit. I mean, I dare say I could probably unmanual gate these now, but just for, for safety's sake and because I put the time in, I'm not going to do that. But yeah, the AIX DSP multiband gate is really powerful and that's cleaned up my mix. Absolutely no end there which is really impressive because uh, that was something I was kind of, you know, I was expecting it to do good things as I was showing you all the, uh, the details at the start there, but I really wasn't expecting it to be that clean. So there you go. I hope you got something interesting from this video. I certainly got a lot out of learning about the multiband drum gate and that will be used by me on anything that I do any drum production with from here on out because spill is my enemy and if I can delete the spill properly, then I can EQ all the drums how I like them for that big larger than life sound without bringing the kind of the psh, kind of a cymbal wash out on the on the drums. So yeah, big thanks to AIX DSP, try saying that 10 times fast, uh, for supplying me with the drum gate and the other plugins and sponsoring this video. And thanks to everybody on Patreon for helping me to make videos like this. Thanks everybody for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.